So Dr. Purvi, thank you so much. And uh, my job is relatively easy because uh, if you look at dietary research, it is very short duration and uh, very non-exciting because there are no hard endpoints. So when we go to medical conferences and I've seen Dr. Nita presenting uh, cases, they are like James Bond movies. So the diagnosis is difficult, then the treatment is more difficult. But when it comes to diet, it is like a slow Agatha Christie stories. So, and secondly, uh, because I'm going to present some case studies, the job is much easier because I don't have to present a lot of evidence because what has happened in those cases, I'm going to present. And luckily, uh, the topic given to me is how to personalize the therapy. So, when we say personalization of dietary therapy, there are three pillars on which we need to personalize. One is the pathophysiology of the disease. So basically we are talking about obesity and obesity is called as mother of all diseases. So obesity may be accompanied by diabetes, obesity may be accompanied by hypertension, heart disease, kidney disease, hyperuricemia, dyslipidemia, then all mechanical problems may be associated with it and in the later part, there may be some malignant component associated with it. So there is a pathophysiology and pathophysiology demands certain inclusion of foods and exclusion of foods. And uh, I don't think we need to discuss anything because uh, I'm seeing a lot of dietary experts here. And uh, nowadays we have Google, we have got a lot of ready reckoner references so that we can always say which foods to be included, which foods to be excluded. Then it comes to the the caregiver, that is the nutritionist, dietitian, doctor, who is going to actually prescribe the diet. And the third most important part is the patient. So let us look what are the factors that we have to look. So this pathophysiology, we have to decide first how many calories to be given in a day. So you must be remembering that uh, in medical colleges, I don't know about when uh, the nutritionist actually goes through their courses of nutrition, but in medical colleges, we were having diet as a four mark question in second MBBS, at least in my times. So the only exercise that we used to do was, uh, there is a right hand side, left hand side, these are the requirements, protein, carbohydrate, fat, and ultimately they never used to match in the bottom line. So somehow you used to match them like the chartered accountants do in accounting. So expenses and intake, that is matched. But nowadays we say that the present calorie intake, and that is the most difficult thing to calculate. They talk about the diet recalls, the seven days diet recall, whatever all those gadgets which maintain, nowadays even we have got photographs and which will tell you the calories and ultimately they say you have to have some 300 calories minus present diet or 500 calories minus present diet. But I don't know how actually this is done because uh, if you calculate the diet recall, the dietary calories consumed by any patient is around 800 calories. And uh, the most common answer given to diet recall is I don't eat anything. That is a common answer. So how to reduce 500 calories from I don't eat anything? Secondly, they say that you have to give a low carbohydrate diet, low calorie diet in terms of 600 calories or 1,200 calories. So personalization, it is basically a interaction or a karate match between a dietitian and a patient to decide how many calories to be taken in a day. Then frequency of feeds is a, like a hydrogen bomb. Some people are, they say only two meals a day. Some people will say every two hours you have to eat. And then everybody has got a lot of scientific evidence stating that how insulin works, how glucagon works, how anti-insulin hormones work. And so the match ultimately ends in a tie and nobody knows exactly what is the frequency of the diet. But uh, when you see the research, American Heart Association has studied all these forms of diet. And uh, they were looking at what is the new onset of diabetes, new onset of hypertension and they found out that three meals a day is the best pattern, the breakfast, lunch, dinner. And even if you go at two or one meal a day or 
starting from four meals a day, the chances of risk or hazard ratios are a little higher to develop these new onset of diseases. But they, not, they don't talk about what are the previously, if the patient is diabetic, what will happen? So the frequency of meal again is a, that decided between patient and a dietitian. Then include exclude list is a fixed thing. And how frequently you need to change a diet. That is again a million dollar question. Whether patient gets tired of the diet, whether the dietitian gets tired of the diet, whether the dietitian wants a new visit from the patient so that she can change the diet. So there are so many factors involved. Then the patient factors. Patient factors are very important because the patient's environment is the biggest cause of concern. Person who is like in Mumbai, they, somebody is staying in Badlapur and goes to VT, that's a two hour commute on one side. And then 10 hours work and commuting back. And uh, then he will say that I have got a family of five or six members and uh, if you tell me to eat every two hours, uh, it is not possible. Or if you tell me to eat uh, only twice a day, so there are some concerns about that. So environment is most important. Then mindset of the patient. There are some patients and uh, the last thing is like his knowledge bank from his friends, colleagues, WhatsApp, Google, Instagram, influencers, all those people decide how the person should be planning a diet, what things should be included. And uh, there are so many things which are included. If you know paneer fall, shahalgam, all those, so many weird things are included in diet and many times the dietitians don't know what these things mean. So we have to take that into account, what is the mindset of that patient. Then patient has got strong belief systems. There are people who say that like, my, how much my grandmother used to eat, I want to eat like that. Somebody says how uh, Tom Cruise eats, I want to eat like that. So there are so many mindsets which are created. Then there are prejudices. Because some persons are prejudiced for a certain kind of a diet. So that has to be taken into account. And I label something as the health quotient of that patient. Because uh, there are some people who are re really, they are unable to understand what is the importance of diet in their health? What is the importance of medicine? What is the importance of lifestyle? So you have to go down to that level and explain to them. It is like a, a student or a child in a fourth grade. And if you want to explain them vitamins, minerals, everything, it is not possible. So health quotient of the patient has to be taken into account. And then there are, there are dietitian factors also. So under whom they are trained, that is very important. I know Shilpa Joshi here. So her students have got a certain mindset. So they, they will write down diet or they will form therapies according to what she has been practicing. Then again, their mindset is also important. There are certain people who are called as keto queens certain people who are called as different names. So the they first thing that comes to their mind is writing that kind of a diet. Then their own belief systems also at, at work. Then their prejudices, their past experiences of writing diets and getting successes. The most important thing is time available to them to negotiate and train the patient. Because as the dietitians become senior and there are more patients come in, the, it is inversely proportional to time available to discuss with the patient. So that is also important and set patterns. There are some people who strongly believe in Mediterranean diet. Some people who believe in intermittent fasting. Some people believe in keto, DASH diet, VLCDs, paleo diets, vegan diets. So these are the three pillars and with all these steps, then what happens? So I'm just jumping into the cases. This is a case Anita, on day one, this is her parameter. So she was 40 years of age, height 5'5", five five, that is 1.65 meters. Weight is, she has lost weight from 88 kg to 79 kg. And BMI has been from 32 to 29. Now, what are the pathophysiological factors? She has got family history of high blood pressure and breast cancer in mother, then her mousy and very strong family history of breast cancer. No prediabetes, no prehypertension, other biochemical parameters are normal. Patient factors have lost 9 kg with Dixit diet during work from home days. And now daily 2 hours of commute and 8 to 10 hours of official work. 
she continues with the same diet with still reduction of portion sizes and for last six months she has not lost weight. So we have to go into negotiation because the whole point in personalizing diet is negotiation between these three factors, pathophysiology, the patient and the dietitian. So this is like suggestions and replies. So the dietitian takes the shortest route. She says that already they have lost 10% weight. 10% weight loss can give you 86% of health benefits. So you maintain that weight, Don't, no need to lose weight. The patient is Google Scholar. So she says, but mother has breast cancer and I have to come down below obesity zone or overweight zone so that I can prevent my chances of developing breast cancer, so I have to lose weight now. So the second suggestion comes that then we will change the meal frequency. You are eating only two meals a day, that 55 minutes pattern. And try multiple small meals because it's an opposite end. The patient says, I am very happy with the two meals a day and has given me good results, so why I should change? Then the dietitian suggests that we have to include higher protein and exercises so that we'll increase your metabolic rate. This is again a very like cloudy concept of metabolic rate. Every patient believes that his or her metabolic rate is low. While the science says when you have got higher weight, your metabolic rate is higher. So, and there are no drugs or no diets which can really increase your metabolic rate. But I have seen people prescribing black coffee with some butter and calling it a bullet coffee and which will increase your metabolic rate. So there are a lot of magic things are available. But this dietitian being a very, what you can say, a conscientious dietitian, she doesn't want to say that. She says, I will increase your protein intake and exercise. The patient's response is, there are working schedules are so tight, I don't have time to exercise. So then we say, the dietitian says that you reduce your calorie consumption then. That is the only alternative. So reduce portion sizes further. So patient's response is already have control portions with difficulty, high control hunger pangs between the feeds. So this is a standstill now. So what should be done? So here the personalization, and I would say like patient says, I've got cheat days in diet. We say there are cheat concepts which are sold to the patient so that we can get some results. So the personalization is, this is what we have done in our clinic. Like Dr. Singh said that exercises. So exercises in C2, that is we have developed that concept. C2 means not in, it is in sitting position. So use the group of agonist and antagonist muscles and increase the tone and decrease the tone and you can use all group of muscles. So while you are traveling, you can do all these exercises. While you are in a meeting, you can do these exercises and they work as almost like tone gaining exercises and which had increased the metabolic rate. So this was prescribed. Then meal supplements was used, but was told to the patient that we are giving you as a medicine. So patient was okay with taking medicines. So a nutritional bar, a 10 gram protein bar was given as a breakfast time. So as a medicine, it was not a diet, it was not a meal supplement, it's a medicine as a given. And we included meal supplement soups before their two meals, which was taken in those diets so that the concept sold was this contains protein which contains even casein protein so that casein is a phosphoprotein which is a which takes long time to get digested so your satiety is longer and next meal hunger is reduced so these are the concepts which are sold which are not false concepts but these are sold to the patient and so the calorie count is reduced further patient does some exercises patient takes one breakfast so meal frequency changed but this is packaged in a new bottle. And uh, this is what happens from one day to 52. Again, weight has now from 79 to 72, and BMI has come from 29 to 26. So this is how we have personalized for this patient. Now this is the second patient. Again, day one, age is 48. Height, we have taken same, 165 centimeters. Weight is 88 and BMI is 32. Now, this person has got a family history of ischemic heart disease. The father died recently of a ischemic heart disease. He has got fatty liver grade 2, HbA1c 6.4, triglyceride 221, cholesterol 201, HDL low 29, HGOT 66, HGPT 62, and GGT of 90. Now, patient factors are he's a frequent traveler. 
and those high profile IT clients, which many times we see, then during when we talked about alcohol, he said it is need my profession. I am a marketing guy in IT and I have to take alcohol with my clients. If I refuse, I may lose my business. So, papi pet ka sawal hai, either liver ko aise kharap karo ya starvation se kharap karo. So, I need alcohol and multiple fail attempt to lose weight with various diets and other modalities. So, he has joined gym, he has joined some those nerve conduction or nerve stimulation exercises, high intensity training and but never stuck to something. So, negotiation was planned for a Mediterranean diet because he's got history of heart disease. Then he says that this is a possible when I'm at home. But when I travel, I don't have any control on my diet. So, I want a different diet for traveling time and different diet when I'm at home. So, I'm ready for a Mediterranean diet at home. And fatty liver needs alcohol solution. Patient says flatly no. It's professional need. So, I will change from whiskey to beer. Now, he asked, you, okay, and this is a common notion that beer is very mild and beer may not cause so much harm as whiskey, rum or all those stronger alcohols can cause. So, personalization, one session was devoted to just explain the role of carbohydrate intake in relation to fatty liver. So, his notion was fats can cause fatty liver, but we were like, could devote that time and he understood the role of carbohydrates in developing fatty liver. Then he was given Mediterranean diet at home and low or no carbohydrate diet for travel because uh, luckily he was a non-vegetarian, so he could eat meat and salads when he was on travel and that is really available everywhere. Salads only with alcohol. That was a compromise that was reached and we told him that you can have any kind of a salad with mayo or with some other dressings, but you have to feel full. Your stomach should be full. Two bowls of salads and then take, instead of taking beer, you have on the rocks, neat single malt whiskey. So that is a cost involved. Plus there is a quantity also involved. And we taught him literally how to, how a great people drink whiskey. So then he was charged up. Okay, then I will have sip by sip. I will restrict to one peg a day and two bowls of two bowls of salads and cetylistat and glutathione was included because of his GDT problems. And in three months, he came down from 88 to 75 and BMI has come to 27.5. So his personalization was a little different. Maybe you can tell me when to stop because there are different cases. Yeah. Yeah. So third case is this Ayesha, day one, age is 58, height is 1.6, weight is 85, BMI is 33. Now pathophysiological factors, she is non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, normal lipid profile, but she has got mechanical problems, back and knee pain, and she has advised bilateral TKR. And mother has got early Alzheimer's disease and has started forgetting things and has got a lot of gloomy feelings. So she is... She went to psychiatrists, run some tests, but then they said there is no clinical depression. So patient is highly educated. She was saying that is it subclinical depression? What I can do? And I want to lose weight early because my movements are restricted and this is going to cause me a lot of problems and I want to get TKR done as early as possible. So wants quick weight loss so she can fit, become fit for TKR. So there was no need of any negotiations. She was ready to do whatever and our dietitian chose keto diet. Now keto diet was chosen, the reason was the history of Alzheimer's disease in mother and keto diets when planned properly are known to give rise to mood elevation and can prevent cognitive decline. So this diet was chosen, this can give little quicker weight loss, mood changes and cognitive improvement can occur. The only thing that we do was there is now keto meters are available, keto fleets and keto meters. So we wanted to really see whether our patient is in nutritional ketosis. So the ketone levels, BHB levels were maintained around 2.5 to 3 so that patient won't go into ketoacidosis or patient won't be just like a placebo keto diet. So this was maintained and from 45 days she came down from 85 to 77 kg and BMI from 33 to 30. 
The fourth case is again 50 years old, again 1.65 height, 74 kg weight, and BMI just 27. Now, the reason for her weight loss was she has got fatty liver. And we calculate in our hospital, we work in liver transplant unit. So we have got a lot of cases where the patient recipient is sick. He wants liver donation as early as possible. And a lot of time is wasted in finding out a live donor. And when the live donor, who is a family member, usually has got strong fatty liver. So the simplest measurement on CT is something called the liver attenuation index. And that has to be plus five or more so that the patient can donate liver safely. So this patient's LAI was minus four and was prospective liver donor. Her husband needs a liver ASAP. Patient was in hospitalized Sir. and decompensated liver. Sir, can this be the last case? Yes. Thank you. So, so here we gave 600 calorie diet, not more than 30 grams of, this is mistake, 30 grams of carbohydrate. So this may be again, a shocker for many, but 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrates are sufficient. Complete meal and food replacement for two weeks, and within two weeks, her LAI came to plus six. So that can happen. So that our hospitals is very happy with us because we have got increased the turnover of these patients because donors can be prepared quickly. The, this is the last case I am presenting. This is a group of yoga teachers. The average BMI is beyond 30. The belief system is that they want to lose weight but they want to stick to something called the chakra system. So now that is their belief system. So what we went through is they gave me a, a dietary choices that these are the food to be included in the diet. And this is a system that they have got strong belief that if Muladhar chakra is affected, then you have to have certain red color foods. If the Anahat chakra is affected, you have to have green color foods. If, particular chakra is affected, you have to have yellow color foods. So we said, no problem. If you are ready to take proteins, we can add colors because nowadays natural colors are available. So we can make proteins in a colored form. You can do 20 minutes of aerobic activity, Baki yoga activity, you continue. And we can choose calories from the foods that you are telling us. So let us calculate calories. You give us food choices. So that's what we have done. And uh, that's why the, the average BMI has come down to 25. So what have we learned? Fads and fashions in diet prescription is here to stay and is ever evolving. So it is difficult to counter the force of marketing and force of faith. So adapting to these while sticking to basics of dietary principles is the key in personalization. So it's a more of an art on understanding the patient respecting the patient's expectations, adapting science to patient's perceived reality, and keeping patient's benefits as our ultimate goal. Thank you so much.